Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that incredible introduction. And um, really, it's quite an honor as somebody who studied um, these issues uh, for most of my life, certainly most of my adult life, to share the stage with Bill Isaac. That was a real treat, and, and he's a living legend uh, among you, so, so you should all take that in. And anything I say uh, will pale in comparison to that, let me assure you. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Events like these play an important role in informing national policymakers of what the industry needs to provide a safe and sound products and services to customers across the country and to unleash their potential to promote economic opportunity. Uh, bringing industry together with regulators, academics, and members of Congress creates a special environment where we can have frank discussions informed by diverse perspectives. In the few minutes I have this morning, I want to focus on economic opportunity, which has been a theme of my time as acting comptroller and a big part of the Treasury's core financial principles released in June. Before I get into that topic, I realize that not everyone is familiar with the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. The OCC was created by President Abraham Lincoln to administer a system of national banks to meet credit and banking needs of consumers, businesses, and communities across the country. We were born out of necessity at a time when creating national standards and an orderly nationwide system of banks promoted national unity, expansion, and economic opportunity. Over the past 154 years, the mission has evolved. It now includes the chartering supervision and regulation of a federal banking system that includes almost 1,400 national banks, federal savings associations, and federal branches of foreign banks operating in this country. The federal system is mostly made up of small community banks that provide services to consumers and businesses on Main Street USA, but it also includes the nation's largest, most complex banks operating globally. I would guess that all of you probably have experience with national banks and federal savings associations. Some pundits see the growth of the online lending industry as a response to the nation's banking industry. And some say that if the banking industry had been sufficiently agile and fully met the need for lending, alternative lenders would not have grown so rapidly. I do not share that, uh, share that view. I see the growth of online lending and marketplace lenders as the natural evolution of banking itself. Your industry demonstrates a certain entrepreneurial spirit to seize economic opportunity that begins with your new idea. That idea may be leveraging the lending power of groups or using new data to assess creditworthiness, or the idea may be a way to make decisions faster or give, give consumers more control over their financial lives. Sweat and talent turn your idea into a business, hopefully a sustainable and profitable one, and that takes engineering new solutions, developing repeatable processes, hiring staff, marketing, financing, paying your debt, and delivering products at the core of your business. Too often, regulatory burden gets in the way of economic opportunity, and that's another reason that organizations like this one are so important. As entrepreneurs, you become experts in your field, but as an industry, you need forums and advocates to champion your concerns and raise awareness of barriers to your success. Policy institutes like this one discuss issues that could shape the next decade of your idea, an idea like the one in the US and Europe in 2005 to pioneer online peer-to-peer -peer lending, and that is an idea that has come a very long way in a short time. How far over the past decade, marketplace lenders have originated about $40 billion in consumer and small business loans in the US. Online lending has doubled every year since 2010. Analysts vary on how high the ceiling is. Some suggest the market will reach nearly 300 billion by 2020, and others suggest as maybe a trillion by 2025. This volume would be a substantial piece of all outstanding unsecured consumer credit in the United States, which alone was 3.7 trillion at the end of 2016. A maturing industry comes with different sorts of issues than a brand new one. 
startup funding fades and shareholders begin to demand performance, or at least progress toward profitability. Last month's earnings showed promise and improvement from the previous year, but some of the most widely recognized companies still stretch for profitability. This performance and the progress it shows have occurred under relatively benign credit conditions and a long, albeit slow, economic expansion. We have seen overall delinquency rates in the country decline steadily since 2012, with minor increases in credit card, auto, and student lending delinquencies in the last year. While the consensus expects the economy to expand at least through 2018, we may be seeing cracks in performance with consumer unsecured charge-offs for marketplace lenders having increased since the fourth quarter of 2015. It remains to be seen how online lending companies and ori loans originated using new models will perform under stress. That's part of a maturing business, and risk is part of economic opportunity. Success requires adapting to new market conditions and effectively managing evolving risks. One way a maturing industry adopts to a changing market conditions is to diversify its funding sources and expand into other sources that offer greater stability. In the earliest stages of the industry's development, funding primarily came from startup lending and then selling fractional loans to retail investors. As the market has grown, more companies have sold entire loans to institutional investors, including banks, private equity, and hedge funds. And as the industry matured, companies have found a balance that includes selling loans to retail and wholesale investors, securitizing loans, and even exploring the potential for deposits. A more fundamental response to changing market conditions involves adapting new business models and adjusting to long-term strategies. Some companies that set out to be bank killers a few years ago are discovering the advantages of being part of the banking system today. Some companies now de desire to become a bank, and a large number of companies are choosing to partner with banks. Other companies still are choosing different paths. Some created by serial entrepreneurs were never intended to be long-term businesses and may be sold or combined with other companies. Some moves demonstrate that as companies grow, they explore alternatives to meet their business goals. Whatever your choice, it should be pursued because it supports your business model and fits the economic opportunity in front of you. Too often, regulatory burden and inefficiency limit those decisions, get in your way, and place a drag on your individual and collective economic opportunity. So let me use that as a segue to discuss the OCC's work to promote economic opportunity and responsible innovation. I am optimistic about the power of innovation to improve banking, expand access, and deliver better products and services in more affordable and sustainable ways. While much of the innovation comes from within the banking system itself, other innovations come from outside the system, from companies like yours. The OCC launched its innovation effort in the summer of 2015. Since then, it has published practical guiding principles, held a public forum, and established a framework for supporting responsible innovation. To implement that framework, the agency established an Office of Innovation that has been up and running since January. Its primary purpose is to make certain that institutions with federal chargers have a regulatory framework that is receptive to responsible innovation and the supervision that supports it. Part of that mission is to assist companies like yours that want to partner with or provide services to banks or even become one. The office, headed by Chief Innovation Officer Beth Knickerbocker, who's with us today, serves as a clearinghouse for innovation-related matters and a central point of contact for OCC staff, banks, non-bank companies, and other industry stakeholders. Internally, the office has worked to raise awareness and understanding of industry trends and issues among OCC staff. The office has published a number of guides and reference materials for community banks, as well as financial technology companies and non-bank institutions. It collaborates on innovation-related issues with OCC business lines and other regulators and facilitates related activities. 
Externally, the office conducts a variety of outreach activities. One involves hosting office hours in hubs of significant financial innovation. So far, the team has held office hours in San Francisco and New York. During those meetings, team members heard from banks exploring potential innovations, companies seeking to work with banks, and more than a few companies interested in becoming national banks. These meetings also allow the agency to share OCC's perspectives early in the innovation development process. The office has already become a valuable resource for national banks and thrifts, and its utility will only increase over time. One aspect of the innovation framework about which many have expressed an interest is the notion of so-called regulatory sandboxes and bank pilots. In October 2016, the OCC stated that one of its priorities would be to develop and implement an optional program for banks to conduct pilots with OCC participation to foster responsible innovation by OCC supervised banks. The idea is to create principles that support the industry's need for a place to experiment while furthering the OCC's understanding of innovative products, services, and technologies. Information gathered in the pilots would also inform OCC policy initiatives. The OCC generally supports agency participation in bank pilots as a useful way to gain valuable regulatory insight, to provide banks a better means of developing products and services in a controlled environment. However, any program we pursue will be voluntary for banks and cannot provide a safe harbor for many compliance requirements. We are still in the early stages of developing our approach and will share additional details as we make progress. Another aspect of the agency's support for responsible innovation involves chartering fintech companies that want to become national banks. I detailed my view in July that the health of the federal banking system depends on its ability to adapt to meet the changing needs and preferences of customers and the market. We must avoid defining banking too narrowly or in a stagnant way that prevents the system from evolving or taking proper and responsible advantage of economic opportunities that result from advances in technology and commerce. Companies that offer banking products and services should be allowed to apply for national bank charters if they choose and if they meet the standards for doing so. Companies engaged in the business of banking can seek a national bank charter under the agency's existing authority to charter full service national banks and federal savings associations, as well as other long established special purpose national banks, such as trust banks, bankers banks, and other so-called SIBA banks. Many fintech and online business models fit well into these categories of national bank charters. Chartering innovative de novo institution through these existing authorities enhances the federal banking system, increases choice, promotes economic opportunity, and can improve services to consumers, businesses, and communities. Interest also remains in the possibility of the OCC offering special purpose national bank charters to non-depository fintech companies engaged in the business of banking. As you know, the Conference of State Bank Supervisors and New York Department of Financial Services have challenged the OCC's authority in this area. We have filed responses in both cases and will continue to defend our authority vigorously. We have not, however, decided whether we will exercise that specific authority to issue special purpose national bank charters to non-depository fintech companies. We will keep you posted. The OCC's initiatives to support innovation are not the only ways we are working to promote economic opportunity. The agency has taken a number of actions to reduce unnecessary burden following its multi-year review of rules and regulations required under the Economic Growth and Regulatory Paperwork Reduction Act. In my Senate testimony in June, I described a number of actions that the agencies and Congress could take to reduce burden and promote economic growth. You may have read about work to revise the Volcker Rule and simplify capital requirements. One example of action that Congress could take involves clarifying the long-held valid-when-made doctrine 
at the heart of the Madden against Midland funding case. The congressional fix supported by the OCC would provide that the rate of interest on a loan made by a bank, savings association, or credit union that is valid when the loan is made remains valid after the transfer of the loan. This proposal reduces uncertainty by reestablishing well-settled law and would create a uniform standard eliminating the differences in treatment of loans made in different judicial circuits. The proposal supports economic opportunity by helping banks, savings associations, and credit unions to sell their loans and thereby promoting liquid markets. Another barrier regarding economic opportunity that I've heard from some online lenders involves difficulty of getting bank accounts and certain banks terminating business accounts and other banking services of online and fintech companies without providing sufficient reason. Some companies have even been told that regulators and specifically the OCC are the reason behind terminating the accounts. Little can affect the economic opportunity of a business more than the inability to obtain banking services. So let me address this one head on. I added my voice to that chorus in letters to Congress denouncing Operation Choke Point last month. And let me repeat those key points here. We at the OCC expect banks to assess the risk posed by individual customers on a case-by-case -case basis and to implement appropriate controls to manage their relationships. The controls banks put in place to manage their risks and decisions about whom to bank are business decisions and matters of banking judgment. The OCC's policy is not to direct to open banks to open or close individual accounts, nor to encourage banks to terminate entire categories of accounts without assessing the risks presented by individual customers or the bank's ability to manage the risk. Banks must make the decision to retain or terminate customer relationships not the regulators, and certainly not the OCC. When banks fail to provide fair access and fair treatment, they cut off economic opportunity for bank customers, whether those customers are individuals or businesses. And if the system fails to provide fairness to all, it cannot be a source of strength to any. I want to close by sharing my optimism for this industry. Whatever business model and long-term path you choose to achieve your business goals, the future is bright. You are changing how financial services are delivered, and in some ways, you are raising the bar for what consumers of financial services should expect. The market domestically and internationally has plenty of room to grow, and today in Washington, there is real energy around reducing unnecessary regulatory burden and promoting economic opportunity. These are good reasons to be optimistic. So thank you again for having me, and I'm happy to answer a few questions as time permits. All right. <laughs> All right. Yes. Would the OCC be interested in issuing an interpretive opinion on valid when made rather than waiting for Congress? Um, I think that's certainly an option, um, and that we're looking into that option. I think the, uh, the, the cleanest uh, route, because the court was interpreting the statute, would to have, be to have congressional clarification. But I think if that um, doesn't co go anywhere, then I think we'll certainly be ready to see what our options are of what we can do, either through promulgating a rule or issuing some type of interpretive guidance. But certainly, I think. What you'll see from the OCC is we will not be hesitant, as we may have been in the past, about defending the valid when made doctrine um, when that comes up in, in further litigation. Yes. Uh, the same question regarding uh, true lender is yeah. as to whether you'll be looking at issuing regulations regarding yeah. when the relationships are to be viewed as a true lender situation or not. Yeah. Um, so on that one, I think there is much more established guidance already out there, and it's a matter of um, hopefully courts following that guidance, uh, because um, certainly as long as I've been in Washington the past two decades, um, this was an issue that had come up even under Comptroller Hawk uh, and, and uh, Comptroller Dugan. 
Um, and, and I think the, the, the guidance from both the, um, the OCC and the FDIC is quite clear uh, of what it means uh, to have a loan originated from a national bank or an FDIC insured bank. Um, but whether the courts follow that or not, I, you know, we have less control over. Anyone, anyone over here on this? Quiet audience. Yes. Uh, you mentioned on the fintech charters that you're waiting uh, or you haven't yet decided whether to pursue those, but you're definitely interested in defending your right to, to, to promulgate those. Is there any data or other activity that you're maybe looking at right now that would tilt you one way or the other or might have an impact on timing? Um, a lot of platforms sort of view this as a, as a salad bar and, and, and many of them um, may look at fintech charters and, and, and I think from the government's perspective it might be better to have direct regulation over some of these fintech firms than um, the current indirect or, or non-existent oversight. Sure, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think really the hesitancy from the OCC side um, is, is just finding the right match and setting the expectations with the industry of what it means to be a national bank and having our own expectations of what it's like to regulate a fintech company, a non-depository fintech company that would become a national bank. So that's, that's really um, you know, why we are continuing to discuss these issues with, uh, with companies. But, you know, we haven't yet, I sort of, anal I, when I was at the Finovay conference a few weeks ago, I said it's sort of like getting into a pool or something. You know, we've just sort of gotten into our, you know, our ankles or so, and, but we need to continue to have conversations with the industry. They need to continue to have conversations with us to see whether there is a match there in the sense of expectations. And the, really, to get down to it, I mean, one of the, um, the issues is a lot of tech, on the technology side of the company, you know, a lot of these companies um, are, you know, really entrepreneurial in the sense of they, they go and they'll either make a success of it or they won't in the first couple of years. And I think the hard part from a banking regulator where we take safety and soundness very seriously, um, there's a lot of reputation uh, interest in what it means to be a national bank and certainly we don't like banks ever to fail um, to put those two together. So I think we're, we're sort of in the progress working on that um, and looking who might be a good candidate for, for such a charter if, if we were to get to such a stage uh, and be ready ourselves to, to regulate that. Yes. So if a company like uh, Google, Amazon, or Apple were to seek out a bank charter, do you think they should be considered for it? Well, I know, I know you asked that question to, uh, to Bill Seidman, and he provided a really good answer, I think, of what all the issues are. Uh, so I don't really plan to, to go through that again, because you know Bill is sort of a, a, a rock star uh, as, as far as uh, running the FDIC through a very difficult time, and if anyone knows what the issues are um, that could come from chartering, uh, you know, the idea of banking and commerce, uh, I think it would be uh, Bill. Uh, as far as the specific companies, I don't think it would be really my place as a regulator uh, to talk about hypothetical applications of specific parties um, that may never decide to, uh, to, to file such applications. So, hi. Yes. Uh, thank you for your comments. So, I think everyone in town is thinking about the CFPB a fair amount and the small dollar rule as it comes out. So, I wanted to ask you if it's going to come out. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you about the 2013 OCC guidance regarding deposit advanced products and if you have any thought as to revisiting that guidance. Um, yes. <laughs> oh, and as a follow up, and do you have any idea of um, timing regarding that? Well, I, look, um, I think we're, obviously the CFPB is doing its thing, we're doing our thing, and we'll see what comes of it when, when it comes of it. 
Any other questions? Yes. Uh, since you raised the uh, CFPB or the question. <laughs> <of> it, <laughs> I didn't raise the CFPB. <laughs> uh, as you know, probably a, a couple of weeks ago, the CFPB issued a no action letter, a uh, regulatory no action letter for the uh, Upstart network. Uh, I believe the, it was under uh, ACOA that they, they did this. And um, I noticed you mentioned that the OCC uh, pilot program, you don't envision a lot of safe harbors. Um, does that mean that there would be no sort of similar type of no action letters or, or, or guidance for? No, for quite the contrary. I think um, what I was meant to say was we don't have control over what other agencies do and certainly encouraged uh, by that development from the CFPB. I think um, certainly as the new regulators, uh, you know, come into place, um, there will be, um, you know, perha and perhaps as the OCC gets further along in its bank pilot program, we can explore if there's, um, you know, demand uh, from the industry uh, about maybe ways we can coordinate better. But I, the only reason I made that comment about not providing safe harbors is I can't myself provide any safe harbor as the acting controller from um, other type of compliance laws and regulations that are enforced by other agencies. Uh, okay. As far as um, for, the, for the pilots, is, is there some sort of uh, uh, schedule that the OC has? OCC I mean, I think has? we're working as fast as we can. The Office of Innovation obviously is uh, sort of up and running on all fronts, but you know, I think we're going to do it as fast as we can because we know how timely this issue is. But I, I can't give you a specific time, time frame today. All right, so you ready to go? Yep, this sounds good. Uh, okay. Round of applause for right. uh, the acting counselor. Thank you for having me today.